Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Turkey Manicotti. That's right, it's the day after the day after Thanksgiving. You've had the sandwiches, you've had the reheats, and now you're looking for something completely different to use up the last of those leftovers, and this could be it. Two things we generally don't have in a traditional Thanksgiving meal would be cheese and tomato. So that's why I think this is gonna work so well, and here is how you do it. So step one, we're gonna make a very eggy crepe batter. So I have two large eggs, some all-purpose white flour, some cold water, a pinch of salt, and a little bit of olive oil. And then we're gonna take our whisk and we're gonna mix this very, very thoroughly, no lumps. So give it a real good working over. Sometimes I'll actually do this in a blender so it's super smooth, but I just did not want to dirty a blender. So I'm using the whisk. So work that over with the whisk until it's completely smooth and it's gonna look like basically a thin pancake batter, all right? When that's done, you're gonna wrap that up and you're gonna let it sit in the fridge for one hour at least. You wanna give that flour time to hydrate. So we're gonna let it rest for a while. And while we're in the fridge, we might as well grab our turkey leftovers and get the filling ready. And because this filling is so deliciously cheesy and moist, this is perfect for the driest, most unappealing of your leftovers. But of course, my turkey was so moist, even these scraps from the end of the breast are still pretty succulent. But regardless, whatever you have, I want you to chop it up. We don't want giant chunks, but we also don't want it minced. We want to be able to tell we're biting into meat. So when that's chopped, we're going to throw that into a mixing bowl, and then we're going to add the rest of the traditional manicotti filling ingredients. First of which would be whole milk ricotta cheese. We're going to throw in an egg. I'm going to do a pinch of dried marjoram, just for a change of pace. A little bit of red pepper flake, because I'm not using cayenne in this recipe. What? That's right. So some red pepper flakes. We need some salt, of course. Some mozzarella cheese. And some finely grated parmesan. And then just to give it some nice color, some nice freshness, and help with our post-Thanksgiving detox, a nice big handful of fresh chopped Italian parsley, and that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and take our spatula and give that a thorough mixing. So once that's thoroughly combined, you can just set that aside until our crepes are made. If it's going to be a while, just refrigerate this. You can actually make this ahead, no problem. So that's done, and it's on to the crepe making. I have a nonstick skillet over medium-high heat. I'm going to brush it fairly generously with olive oil. Then I'm going to dump in a quarter cup or so of the batter. And you want to swirl it around, tilt the pan, so it covers as much of the bottom as you can. All right, do not obsess over it being perfectly round. Does not matter at all. And again, we're on medium-high heat, so these are going to cook really quick. So I'm going to say it's about a minute to a minute and a half per side. You're going to flip it over. The side you started with is going to be sort of lighter and smoother. And that second side, as you'll see here, is going to have these little golden brown dimples. Those are very cute, I think. And once they're done, you can just pile them up on a plate. All right, they're not going to stick together, so no worries. So as you cook them, just pile them up. If you're doing a whole bunch, you can have two pans going at once. All right. And once your crepes are done, we are ready for final assembly. And before we start stuffing our crepes, we're going to go ahead and put a little bit of tomato sauce in the bottom of our baking dish. I'm doing a pretty small batch here. I'm only making four. You can obviously do more and use a bigger pan, of course. And once your baking pan is prepped, you're ready to start stuffing your manicotti. I like to put that golden brown dimpled side down. All right, so we're going to put the filling on the smoother side. So I'm going to scoop on one fourth of my filling. And then you just roll it up. Nothing complicated. Now I like to tuck in my sides. That's totally optional. I've had this many times where it's just rolled up and the ends are left kind of floppy. Whatever you're into. Some people like them tucked, some people like them floppy. All right, you are the boss of your little muffs. Which, by the way, is what monocotti means in Italian, little muffs. And, of course, muff being one of those fur-lined tubes that you use to keep your hands warm. All right, so you're going to roll that up. You're going to place that in your baking dish. And right here I realized, hmm, that crepe is touching the edge. So I went around with a little bit of olive oil that I used to grease the pan with. So I did that three more times, I placed those in, and then we're going to go down with some extra sauce on top, but mostly down the middle. And this is mostly an appearance thing. We want some of the manicotti to be saucy, but it's nice to have a little bit of exposed crepe, so you get a little bit of browning in the oven. So I'm going to put my sauce over like that. I'm going to grate over some more Parmesan. And last but not least, a very light drizzling of olive oil, just a few drops here and there, just to moisten the surface. Makes it look like you know what you're doing. And those beautiful little muffs are ready for the oven. So we're going to place that in a preheated 350 degree oven for 45 minutes. And when they're done, they look like this, which I think looks pretty beautiful. So they're going to be a little puffed up when you first take them out. 
but they will deflate slightly as they cool. Speaking of cool, you want to let these sit at least five minutes before you serve them. They will just be too, too hot to enjoy. So while we're waiting, let's give them a little garnish of Parmesan cheese, a little more fresh Italian parsley, and that's it. Turkey manicotti. And who would have thought this was inspired by trying to get rid of leftovers? It looks like we totally did this on purpose. Of course, if you wanted to serve some extra sauce on these, you could, but you know what? I don't. For me, it's not about the sauce. It's all about that cheesy, amazing filling and that tender, eggy, pasta-like crepe. Just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And yes, many versions do use those pasta tubes, but I think the crepe is so much nicer for this and really not hard to make. You can do the crepes ahead of time. You can do the filling ahead of time. And like you saw, a great way to use up any kind of leftover meat, especially turkey that you're sick of and you don't want to taste like turkey anymore. So whether it's right after Thanksgiving or just any time of the year, I hope you give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Turkey noodle casserole. That's right, a post Thanksgiving leftover turkey special edition. And there it is, the dreaded leftover turkey. You know, you can only eat so much turkey soup and hot turkey sandwiches. So this is a delicious way to use up the last of that turkey. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull off the skin because skin is not that appetizing in a casserole. So pull off the skin, pull off the meat, and then chop the meat into fairly small pieces. So there you go, I got about three cups or so. The amount really doesn't matter. This is gonna work with whatever you have. All right, so my turkey is cut. I'm gonna make a little bit of a white sauce here with some butter and some flour. And I know what you're thinking. Man, we've been making a lot of roux lately. You're right, it's roux season. All right, so we're gonna cook the flour in the butter on medium heat for about three or four minutes just to take the raw edge off. And a tip I haven't given you in a while, one way you can tell it's cooked long enough is if the flour smells like cooked pie crust. Once your roux is cooked, we're gonna drizzle in our cold milk. All right, start off slow, and then you can pour it in a little quicker. If the milk's cold, you shouldn't have much problems with lumps. All right, once the milk is stirred in, we're gonna bring that up to a simmer, of course. And while it comes to a simmer, we're gonna add stuff. I'm gonna add a can of condensed cream of mushroom soup. And what looks better than condensed cream of mushroom soup? Uh, anything. So it's not the most attractive thing in the world, but it wouldn't be a classic old school American casserole without it. All right, after the soup, I'm gonna spice this up a little bit. I'm gonna add something called garam masala, which is basically a type of curry powder mixture. You could certainly use curry powder. I'm also gonna put in some dry tarragon, my secret ingredient in this. Fresh tarragon would also work. I'm gonna stir that in. I'm also gonna add some chopped green onion, some diced red bell pepper, and green bell pepper. All right, we're gonna stir that in. We're still on medium heat. We're gonna bring that up to a simmer. Make sure you stir occasionally. All right, you can see it bubbling up around the sides there. Let that cook for about two minutes and then turn off the heat. Very critical, you turn off the heat at this point before you add the cheese. I'm using a mixture of white cheddar and pepper jack. And not just any pepper jack, habanero jack. All right, so the cheese goes in, the heat is off. As soon as the cheese melts, which is only gonna take a couple minutes, just set it aside and reserve till needed which isn't gonna be long. All right, once your sauce is done, I'm gonna boil some egg noodles. Make sure your water is well salted. And we're gonna cook that one minute less than the package directions, all right? Once that's done, I want you to drain it really well. By the way, do not rinse those noodles, please. All right, we're ready for final assembly. And for this step, I like big bowls and I cannot lie. Other chefs can't deny that it's easier to mix in a big bowl. All right, so we're gonna dump in the turkey meat. We're gonna dump in the noodles. We're gonna pour in that sauce and we're gonna take a big spatula and fold it all together. And the reason I like big bowls and I cannot lie is because it's just so much easier to distribute everything evenly, also known as distribute, all those ingredients evenly throughout the noodles. And that way when you dump it into your casserole dish, a large casserole dish by the way, you're in great shape. I'm gonna spread that out evenly. Now for the topping. I was gonna do a classic breadcrumb topping but then I saw in my pantry a bag of New York cheddar potato chips. So I decided to smash that up, sprinkle that over the top. I'm gonna to take the tines of a fork and just press that down a little bit so the crumbs are kind of sticking to that sauce a little bit. 
All right, that's going to go in a 350 degree oven until the top is browned and the sauce is bubbling around the sides. Everything's basically cooked in there, so you don't have to worry about that. But you do want to make sure it's heated all the way through and you get a really beautiful crust on it like that. And I'll be honest, when this came out, I was like, I really want to pull one of those crunchy pieces off and eat it. But then I realized I hadn't taken any photos yet, and I'm like, no, don't do it. So let it rest at least 10, 15 minutes. Serve it up and dig in. It's so delicious. You'll totally forget you've been eating turkey for the last three days. It'll be like a whole new experience. I think the peppers and spicy cheese really help. And you know what? Things that are topped with crispy potato chip crumbs are never bad. So anyway, I really hope you give this a try after your Thanksgiving feast. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Turkey flautas. That's right, it's dry, it's old, and people are tired of it. No, I'm not talking about my sense of humor. I'm talking about the last of that leftover Thanksgiving turkey. Because by about the second or third day, they're just not that appetizing anymore. Which is why I think you should learn this easy and delicious flautas technique. I mean, there's an old restaurant saying, when in doubt, add cheese and fry it. And that certainly works out here. So let's go ahead and get started with the dreaded leftover, leftover turkey. So the first step here, we'll go ahead and shred the rest of our turkey into a bowl. And yes, it would be a little faster to cut this up, but I do prefer the shredding. I think the texture is going to be better, but more importantly, if you dice it, The filling tends to fall out of the ends as you fry these. But of course, those kind of decisions are up to you. You are the Jehovah's of your leftovers, but I do recommend taking the extra minute to shred. And then once that's set, we'll add the rest of the ingredients, which is not that many. So we'll toss in a little bit of salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper, followed by some, no, not cayenne. I know you're a little shocked, but don't be, because the next ingredient is going to be pepper jack. So that's going to provide me with plenty of heat, And by the way, I know you're tired, but please grate that yourself. Not a lot of people realize the pre-grated stuff is actually coated with powdered sawdust. True story. So unless you're cooking for termites, you want to grate that fresh. And then last but not least, I'm going to throw in a handful of green onions. And then we'll go ahead and take a fork and mix this up. So we're going with a very simple filling here, mostly turkey and cheese. And while you're stirring this together, try to think of what else you might have that would work in this. Okay, maybe you have a little leftover peas and carrots. That could work. Or maybe we'll dice up the rest of those roasted sweet potatoes. But anyway, the point is, as you're mixing, think of other leftovers that might be included in this. And then once this mixture is mixed up, we have a couple choices. We can wrap it up and pop it in the fridge until we need it. Or we could start building our flautas right away, which is what I'm going to do right now. And for that, you're going to need some small corn tortillas. And I'm going to use this white corn variety, but yellow corn works just as good. And then what we need to do before we can use these is steam them. And for me, the easiest way is just to do them in a bag in the microwave. So I will put those in a piece of paper towel like this and pop those in a zip top bag. Except don't seal it all the way, just go about halfway or so. And then what we'll do is we'll pop that in the microwave for about 45 seconds. After which you should be looking at a bag full of very soft, very hot and steamy tortillas, which we can now roll without breaking. So we'll kind of keep those covered and wrapped up so they stay warm while we work. And then the other thing we're going to need that's totally optional is some egg white. I'm going to use that to seal mine together, although I've been told that's totally unnecessary. But since the person that showed me how to make these used it, I'm going to use it. And that's something else we can debate on the blog. And at this point, we are ready to start production. So what we're going to do is place our hot, flexible tortillas on the cutting board. And yes, you can do these just using a single tortilla. But what I prefer is to make slightly larger ones using two overlap like this. Okay, in the business, this is referred to as rolling on dubs. So we'll place down two tortillas like that. And then we'll go ahead and place down between a quarter cup and a third of a cup of our filling. And as you can see, I'm kind of placing that filling just south of the equator. And then I'm going to dip my finger into my possibly unnecessary egg white. And kind of paint that across the opposite edge like that. And then all we need to do is bring that tortilla over like this. And roll it up fairly tightly into a nice neat package. And one of the big keys here, really the only key, is to make sure you end up with the fold on the bottom. And that's all there is to it. So you'll continue rolling those up as shown until your filling's gone. And by the way, for the sake of this video, I'm just doing two. The sun was setting and I was home alone. It's fine. And I should mention here, once these are rolled, you could put these in the fridge and fry them later. But I'm not going to. I'm going to cook mine now. So at this point, let's head over to the stove, where I have about a quarter of an inch of vegetable oil in a saute pan set over medium heat. And one great way to tell if your oil's hot enough to fry is just to dip a little scrap piece of tortilla into the oil. And if it starts bubbling, you're ready. 
So I could tell my oil was preheated. So I'm going to go ahead and carefully place my flautus in the oil, seam side down. But you knew that. And as soon as those are placed in, I do like to press the tops with a spatula just for a few seconds to make sure those bottoms are nice and flat and staying together. And then all we need to do here is continue cooking on medium until these are beautifully crispy and golden and heated through. And please note, one reason we're doing this on medium heat is because we don't want the outside to get too brown too fast. All right, if the oil's too hot, the outside's going to be dark brown and starting to burn, and the inside's still going to be cold. And by the way, if that does happen and the outsides are cooked before you think the insides are, you can totally finish these in the oven, which is what we would do if we were doing a lot of these anyway. So I let mine fry on medium for about three or four minutes per side, and then, because I like to play with my food, I gave him another couple flips, just to make sure everything was getting nice and crispy. I also rotated my pan, for no apparent reason. And a couple things I want to mention here. Appearances to the contrary, these really do not absorb a lot of oil and get greasy. And because we shredded our meat, virtually no filling went into that oil. So I actually think these are more user-friendly than people might imagine. And then once we think our flattas are nice and crispy and golden brown, and our filling heated through, we will remove those from the pan, and of course let any excess oil drip off, and we'll just let those drain on a paper towel for about a minute before we set up our plate, which is what I'm going to do right now. And of course, there's hundreds of ways you could finish these off, but what I'm going to do is scatter over some finely shaved cabbage, and not just any cabbage, I'm using Savoy cabbage. That's why it's all crinkly and gorgeous. So if you haven't heard of Savoy cabbage, you should probably Google it. It's basically the kind of cabbage that movie stars eat. I mean, you think George Clooney's eating regular cabbage? Heck no. I'm also going to go ahead and garnish with a spoon of guacamole, or at least that's what I'm calling it. It's really just an avocado I mashed with some lemon and salt. I will also be doing a spoon of sour cream, as well as a couple spoons of roasted tomato salsa, which I will admit is from a jar. I mean, what kind of crazy person's making homemade salsa a couple days after cooking a Thanksgiving meal? Besides, the one I used was created by a celebrity chef, so you know it's got to be good. And then we'll finish off with some fresh cilantro, as well as another pinch of Savoy, because I was not happy with my cabbage placement. And that's it, our leftover Thanksgiving turkey flautas are done! And I won't lie, if I was going to make these from scratch, I would probably use shredded beef. But even using turkey in this, and dry leftover turkey at that, this is still incredible. Of course we have that hot crispy shell encasing our cheesy turkey mixture. I mean just that part's good. But when you add that fresh crunch of the cabbage, as well as that guacamole and sour cream and salsa, you're talking about something that's delicious and a lot of fun to eat. And while I have no way of knowing for sure what your family's going to be thinking about while they eat this, I do know what they won't be thinking. Hey, this is leftover turkey. These are so tasty, that's not even going to cross their mind. But anyway, that's it. Turkey flout us. Making something nice with turkey leftovers is not that big of a deal. But making something amazing with turkey leftover leftovers, that's the real challenge. And for that, I think this flautas technique is just the thing. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Turkey rice. That's right. Welcome to another annual installment of what the heck do I do with the rest of this leftover turkey? And for me, what really makes a recipe using leftover holiday turkey great is that of course, not only should it look and taste good, but it should also be very simple to make and not have a lot of ingredients. Plus, and just as importantly, it should be different enough so as not to remind us of the meal where the leftovers came from. And this simple but amazing turkey rice checks all those boxes. So with that, let's go ahead and toss whatever leftover turkey we have in a soup pot, which for me were a thigh and a leg, and a few assorted scraps of white meat. And then to this we will add four cups of chicken broth or stock, or of course turkey broth or stock. Which reminds me, if you've already picked all the meat off the bones and made a proper stock, you can obviously skip ahead to the cooking the rice part. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and toss in a diced onion, and then bring this up to a simmer on high heat. And by the way, if you're wondering if I pulled the skin off that thigh and wrapped it around some stuffing and ate it like that, yes I did. Good guess. And then what we'll do once things start to bubble is back our heat down to medium low, at which point we'll cover this, and we will simmer it for about an hour or until our meat has pretty much fallen off the bones. And because we don't have a ton of liquid in this, and the meat is not fully covered, it's never a bad idea about halfway through to uncover this, and maybe turn those pieces over. So I did that. And you probably should as well. And I don't know about you, but it's tough for me to just let something sit on the stove for an hour and not touch it or do something to it. So even if this doesn't make a huge difference to the final product, I'm still a fan of the maneuver. And that's it, we'll simply cover that back up. 
and let it continue simmering for another half hour or so, or until, like I said, that meat has pretty much fallen off the bone. And once we do reach that stage, we'll go ahead and remove our meat and bones to a bowl, which I did mostly with these tongs, but a better tool would be something called a spider, which is what we call in the business, one of these round, long-handled strainer things. And if there's a foodie in your family that doesn't have one of these, that would make a great gift. But anyway, once we remove our meat, we'll go ahead and let that cool, at least enough so we can pull it off the bone and cut it up. And then what we'll do while we're waiting for that is bring our liquid back to a boil over high heat, at which point we're going to stir in about three quarters of a cup of white rice. And this time I'm actually using a medium grain rice, but I usually use long grain, which works beautifully, as by the way, would a short grain rice. The only difference being the cooking times, which you will of course adjust. But anyway, once that's been stirred in, we can go ahead and season this up a little bit with a little bit of freshly ground black pepper, as well as a little touch of cayenne, and of course a big pinch of salt. And then what we'll do at this point is lower our heat to medium, and we'll let our rice cook for about 10 minutes to give it a little bit of a head start before we add our turkey back in. Speaking of which, while our rice is simmering for that 10 minutes, we can go back and pick that meat off the bone. And of course, as we pull that meat off, we always wanna be looking for small bones, cartilage, and assorted tendons. Since those things are a lawsuit waiting to happen. And that's it, once we have a nice pile of meat, we'll go ahead and chop that up as big or small as we want. And right here, you're gonna get a great look at how big I wanted my pieces. And at this point, we'll head back to the stove to check our rice, which after about 10 minutes is not gonna be cooked yet, of course. But as you can see, it has started to plump up. And at this point, we are free to go ahead and stir in our turkey meat. And if we so choose, maybe another splash of stock or broth. And of course, that's gonna depend on how thick you want this. All right, I do sort of want this kind of thick when it's cooked, but not super, super, super bend the spoon thick. So yes, I did splash in another splash, since after stirring and observing, I thought it needed another splash. But of course, you're gonna take a look at yours and decide for yourself. I mean, you are after all the curious George of your turkey rice porridge, which by the way, really is what this recipe should be called, but it's not, because I don't know much, but I do know that not that many people are gonna click on a link for turkey rice porridge. But anyway, once we have everything stirred in, we will adjust our heat to somewhere between medium and medium low and cook this stirring for another, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, or until that rice is as tender as we want. And we can do that from anywhere between just barely tender, all the way to absolutely soft and falling apart. And in case you're keeping score at home, I like to go somewhere in between. And then what I like to do while my rice finishes cooking is take some green onions, some sliced hot or sweet red chilies, and a little bit of freshly picked herb like cilantro. And I like to make this sort of quick, colorful, vibrant salsa for the top. And what we'll do first is slice our onions. And then once those are broken down, we'll toss on our peppers. And we'll continue chopping until we have those into a fairly fine dice. At which point we will toss over our herbs and continue chopping until this is as fine as we want. And why I'm really hoping you do this technically optional step is because great dishes are so often about contrast. And when you consider what we're gonna be serving up, which is something that's hot and soft and rich and kind of sticky, and as we mentioned, kind of porridge-like, what better contrast than topping it with something like this? So to summarize, take the extra five minutes and make this. And that's it, we'll head back to the stove, where as you may remember, our rice and turkey is cooking until we think it's done, as judged by you. And besides deciding when it's at the perfect texture, we're also of course gonna taste for seasoning, since this might and probably will need a little more salt. So I went ahead and adjusted mine and deemed it absolutely perfect and exactly how I wanted it, which means we can go ahead and serve that up in hopefully a warm bowl, and then top it with whatever we're calling our onion, pepper, herb mixture. I mean, I guess it's a salsa, but it's also sort of gremolata-like. So maybe it's actually a salsalata. But anyway, we will top that off, and then grab a spoon and dig right in. And there are literally thousands of things you can make with leftover turkey, but this, my friends, besides a sandwich, might be my favorite. It is just so simple and warm and comforting and addictively sticky, but not sticky from the starch and the rice. All right, a little bit from that, but sticky from all the gelatin produced by all the connective tissue in that dark meat. All right, that really is what makes it so satisfying and delicious. And again, topping it with those freshly chopped flavorful bits really elevates this to a whole other level. And of course, we could also use this as a catch-all for any leftover veggies we might have around as well. 
But you know what? This is so absolutely perfect just like this. I don't really think I want any chopped up green beans and sweet potatoes and Brussels sprouts in this. All right, it's called turkey rice, not turkey rice and stuff. So my official recommendation is to eat it just like this. Oh, and one last thing I should mention here. I enjoy this with a very high ratio of meat to rice. All right, this is almost literally half and half, which is why earlier we didn't use a ton of liquid to simmer our turkey in. So for me, that's another key. I kind of want this to be a meat with rice dish, not a rice with meat dish. But regardless of how much meat you put in, I really do hope you give this very simple, easy, comforting, and very delicious turkey rice recipe a try soon. So please follow the links below to get the ingredient amounts, a written printable recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with turkey tamale pie. That's right, I'm going to show you how to make a tamale pie out of leftover turkey. Because let's face it, no matter how moist and delicious your roast turkey turned out, the leftovers can be a little bit dry and uninteresting, which is the exact opposite of what you're going to experience with this. In fact, this came out so well, even if you don't have any leftover turkey, you should roast one just to use for this, and maybe make a few sandwiches but mostly for this. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by sauteing a diced onion in a little bit of olive oil over medium high heat, along with, of course, the traditional giant pinch of salt. And what we'll do is cook these stirring for a few minutes until they just start to turn translucent. And all that means is that those pieces of onion are gonna go from firm and white to slightly softer in this. Okay, we're just basically taking that raw edge off. And then once our onions are looking a little something like that, We'll go ahead and toss in a whole bunch of diced peppers. And this time I went with a red bell pepper, plus a couple beautiful dark green poblano peppers. But of course, use whatever you want. I mean, you guys are after all the schleppers of your peppers. So whatever you carry back from the store will work. But regardless of what you use, we'll go ahead and season that up with some freshly ground black pepper, some ground cumin, and a nice big pinch of dry oregano. And what we'll do is stir that all together and cook it for about two minutes until our peppers just start to soften up, at which point we're gonna add what might be the most important ingredient, one can of whole chipotle peppers packed in adobo sauce. And if you're not familiar, these are basically whole red jalapeno peppers that have been smoked over hot coals, or at least that's what the brochure says, and then packed in an amazingly flavorful chili sauce. And what we'll do is go ahead and break those up and stir them in with our spatula. And fair warning, those things are pretty spicy, which by the way explains why you're not gonna see me add any cayenne to this. All right, that stuff's gonna provide plenty of heat. And what we'll do as soon as that's all been broken up and stirred in is turn off our heat and reserve that pan of goodies while we move on to prep our turkey, which most likely will be some leftover dry Thanksgiving turkey. And what we'll do is make sure we've removed the bones and skin before cutting this up into like quarter inch cubes. And what you're seeing here are the remnants to a very unsuccessful honey roast turkey recipe, which came out very bland and unexciting. But hey, at least it was dry. The good news, however, is that it's perfect for a recipe like this. So I went ahead and cubed up about three or four cups. And once that's set, we'll go ahead and add that to our pan of onions and peppers, along with a whole bunch of sharp cheddar cheese, or any melty cheese. But cheddar is the official recommendation. And then we will follow that with a jar or can of red enchilada sauce from the store. Do not make that yourself. I mean, you could, but don't. Plus, I don't think I've ever posted a recipe for enchilada sauce, which we probably should. But anyway, we'll finish up with some salt, as well as some chicken broth that, as you might be able to see, I used to rinse out my jar of enchilada sauce. And we'll dump that in and stir everything together before transferring that into whatever casserole dish we're going to use. And please note how runny and loose this mixture is. Okay, we want to make sure we start with a lot of liquid, so once this bakes, it stays a little bit saucy. All right, a dry tamale pie is not fly as they say. And then what we'll do once that's been transferred in is move on to the last major component, a very, very thin cornbread batter. And that's going to start with some cornmeal. And I'm using kind of a medium grind, but fine cornmeal will also work. And then we're also going to toss in some self-rising flour, which is nothing more than flour with a baking powder and salt milled into it. And then we're also going to need a little bit of white sugar, as well as, of course, a little bit of salt. And then what we'll want to do is take a whisk and give this all a mix so that all those ingredients are nicely combined before we add our wet ingredients. 
and by wet ingredients I mean a couple large eggs, as well as some nice cold fresh whole milk. And that's it, we'll just take our whisk and mix this all together to form, like I said, a very thin batter. And yes, in case you're wondering, we do usually use buttermilk when we make cornbread, which gives it a nice little tanginess. But here with this particular filling, I think something a little bit on the sweeter side will work better. But having said that, either one will work. And then once we have that mixed up, we'll go ahead and ladle that carefully over our turkey filling. And by applying it this way, we're gonna hopefully get a nice even layer, since if we just dump this in, it might be thicker in some spots than others. So it really is better to take an extra minute and sort of ladle that over carefully. And the reason we want that so thin is that I'm not trying to make a turkey chili with cornbread baked on top. Okay, we wanna get a little bit closer to the texture of an actual tamale, which is much denser and moister. So I do realize it looks a little watery, but you'll see once this bakes, it's gonna be perfect. Oh, and please note, we have our casserole dish set over a sheet pan because this is almost always gonna bubble over. So make sure you put something under your dish. And then what we'll do to finish this off is go ahead and scatter over the rest of our cheese, which by the way is why we didn't add any butter to the batter. Oh yeah, this is a no butter batter because the butter fat in that cheese is gonna provide all we need. And that's it, once our cheese has been applied to the top, we can go ahead and transfer this into the center of a 375 degree oven for about 45 minutes to an hour, or until it's beautifully browned and probably bubbling over. And our cornbread-ish topping has cooked through, which if you want, you can test with a toothpick, and it should come out clean. Okay, if it comes out dirty and it has a bunch of wet batter on it, put it back in for a few more minutes. But mine was perfect. And at this point, I usually tell you to let things rest for a few minutes. But with this, you really don't have to. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut a piece and serve that up. And right here you can get a great look at our still beautifully saucy filling, which is why we really do want that stuff nice and juicy before this goes in the oven. And then by all means, feel free to eat this as is. But I like to finish mine off with a nice dollop of sour cream, which not only looks pretty, but also provides a contrast in taste and temperature. Plus I also like to show off my dolloping skills. And that's it, I finished up with a little bit of chopped cilantro and my leftover turkey tamale pie was ready to enjoy. So I grabbed a spoon and dug in, and I could not have been happier with how this came out. Okay, you know that thing they shined in people's eyes in that movie Men in Black to erase their memories? This tamale pie is that for dry turkey. Okay, you're gonna forget you even roasted a turkey. And above and beyond that highly seasoned, super flavorful, very moist filling, we also of course have that slightly sweet topping that is basically halfway between a classic cornbread and that softer, much moister, traditional tamale dough. So I'm not officially saying I hope your turkey's a little overcooked and people don't eat that much so that you have plenty of leftovers to make this, but unofficially I am saying that. So I really did love everything about this. So whether you end up making this with actual leftover turkey or you end up cooking some turkey just to make this, or of course just substitute with some chicken, which would totally work. I really do hope you give this delicious tamale pie a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.